first off, Anders, I appreciate you taking the time. Welcome to the Technoid Podcast. For anyone who's listening to the show, if you listen to it all the time, this is probably not new news. If you're kind of new to the show, the last five or six guests we have, whether we in, you know tried, intended to get there or not, we, we've landed on the concept that the markets are crazy and there's been a lot of people who've made a lot of money in it forever. And we're obviously recording this before it'll go public. But the last two days or so of trading have been a disaster, at least for me. The tech stocks are like wiped off. And I think it's a pivotal time for those who either have never done any investing to get in while things are low, or I guess we'll see how low they go, but like for right now, low, or if you're in it right now and you've only seen up, like w- welcome to reality. Uh, this is what it's like. And so I think a big conversation that gets missed, it, it, we, we have it a lot, financial literacy, we have it a lot, but I really don't think that it's a, a conversation that takes place at the retail level. I think it's like, you know, you have money, you've, you've come from money. Uh, the idea of investing is not new to you. You're learning the nuances, you're learning puts and options and things. That's not the same thing as talking to someone who literally never invested money in their life before, and they're trying to figure out how to create wealth. And so this conversation, um, I think needs to be had more. And so we've been doing a lot of it. And I've got you on here to talk a little bit about facet wealth, and you guys are making some news yourself. So first and foremost, welcome. And second, uh, let's jump at it. Let's start talking about money and and facet wealth. So the way that I talk about facet is that we exist for the huge number of American households, like tens of millions of American households that have questions about money. And I talk about money, not just in terms of like dollars and cents, but like big financial decisions that you have to, you, that, that impact your, your day. Houses, life. cars, college, all of it. Exactly. Exactly. And don't really know where to turn because on the one hand, there's too much nuance and complexity in their life for like a purely DIY solution, like, you know, someone like a, a wealth front or a betterment or, you know, a robo advisor, but they don't have the sort of traditional, you know, asset level that a, that a wealth manager would be interested in, right? So they don't have more than a million bucks yep. um, that they can invest that a, that an, a wealth manager is going to, going to get excited about working with them on. And they're, they're just kind of generally skeptical of the industry. Um, they're not really sure where to start and basically have, have a bunch of questions and need the help. And so, you know, the way to think about facet is that we talk about is like, we've kind of built financial planning for the, the way that it should be. Right. So you come to us and we'll help you with things exactly what you said, right? Like, yeah, you know, how should I think about saving for a house? How should I think about starting a family? I'm not super happy in my job. Should I change careers? And what are the financial implications of, of that? Um, so much of what we do is almost has like a counseling aspect to it as much as, uh, as, as anything else. So there are a few kind of core pillars to what we do. So, so first off, every one of our clients works with a dedicated certified financial planner. It's the top certification you can get in the financial planning world. You have to study for about three years to actually get, uh, get that certification and do an apprenticeship. Um, as well. Uh, so you're working with a real human. You're not calling into a call center. It's someone that you build a relationship with over time. The second piece is that, you know, kind of what we talked about, like we do everything in, uh, in your financial life, everything in your life that money touches. You know, traditionally, you've had to have money to invest with someone if you wanted to work with a, with a financial planner or wealth manager, like the sort of, you know, way that you work with them. You say, okay, here's my money to manage and you're going to give me a financial plan as, as part of that. Um, we don't have that requirement. Uh, so, you know, we, we do manage like uh, over a billion dollars of, of assets, but at the same time, like we work with, you know, half of our clients just talk to us about monthly cash flow or my parents are aging and how should I think about healthcare for them over the long run, stuff like that. Um, the sort of, the next piece is uh, we have a, we charge with an annual subscription. So it's not tied to assets. It's not tied to any sort of product sales It's super transparent. You know exactly what you're paying for, exactly what you're getting. Our view on that is that it's way more consumer centric and just like the way the world is moving is towards much more sort of transparent pricing um, across the board, not just in financial services. And the the financial services industry has been a a laggard for a long time in terms of opaque pricing. Um, And eventually that's going to catch up with them. Um, so that's basically what we do. So, you know, at this point, we've got uh, close to 11,000 clients. We've been sort of, you know, on a, on a great growth trajectory, uh, basically grown like 400% since COVID started. So, um, you know, what we found is that as, uh, as the world has, has changed rapidly, people have more and more questions and, you know, we're in a great, great position to, to, help, to help folks understand it. And of course, uh, a little birdie was tweeting in my ear that you guys might have raised a little bit of cash as well as a result of some of this growth. 
And yeah. that would only uh, pour fuel on this fire that COVID has, has brought you. We've just announced a $100 million Series C um, led by Durable Capital Partners. Uh, super, super excited to have them on board. That brings our total up. I think we've raised at this point about $165 million uh, yep. total. But this is you know, definitely our, our biggest round. And, um, and it's all going towards, towards growth and just enhancing the, the client experience. I mean, we, we see an opportunity of 40 million households that sort of fall into this between category and they need the help and there aren't great solutions there. Um, and so it's a huge market. No one's really paying attention to it. And it's, uh, you know, I, I think we're in a great position to, to take advantage of it. One thing I didn't mention, but just kind of an, another interesting, uh, actually probably one of my favorite data points is that, you know, that 11,000 clients we have, 75% have never worked with a financial advisor before. So I think that just goes to show like, you know, we're not really stealing market share for people. We're, we're not doing it better. We're doing it different. Right. And, and I think that's an important kind of piece here is money is not all made equal. Like, because I have a bunch of cash, let's just use $100,000 as a number. Whether I have $100,000 in actual cash sitting in my bank account or $100,000 in a home or $100,000 in debt, the reality is all of us need some sort of financial advice as to like how to turn the 100 in debt upside down, how to make sure that I'm leveraging my house and able to pay down other debt or use it as collateral or whatever to give myself some breathing room. And then there's those that have 100,000 in cash and you're assuming that they have assets, but let's say for the sake of argument that maybe it's just cash and they live and they rent and whatever, or maybe they have assets and they have the cash. All of those things are different and require a different sort of set of hands. And one of the conversations that I've, I've had recently, one that comes to mind is I, I had the guy from Fitbucks on recently and he is raising uh, via Republic and we did a pitch review and all this other stuff. I like what he's doing. It addresses, it, I don't think it goes as far as you do, but it addresses sort of this part where robo investing, like for me personally, I got into investing just using acorns as simple and stupid as that is. And it was like, Oh, I just, I had, you know, no money coming in. I had no assets. I was like, Oh, I'm just going to save money. And if it, if it invests great. And then I kind of picked up the habit and realized it and started actually investing. And now it's a different story and I do it for a living. But speaking of that, they really should sponsor the show now that I think about it, but that's, that's a whole nother, <laughs> that's a whole nother aside. The part here that is a, a disconnect, I think, is if you've never invested before, and, and also when you buy homes and things, I don't think people like that view it as investing. I don't think that they're categorizing this in the same way, which really tilts your view, I think, in the wrong direction. So one of the things I want to get into with you a little bit here is when I think of a newcomer, they see RoboApp, you could use Robinhood, you could use a bunch of different stuff. I like M1, but I also know what I'm doing. So I, I use it to its full capacity. When you look at someone who has the choice of, are you conservative, are you moderate, or are you aggressive in your investing? And everything that's done with your money is based on those one of three things. It kind of makes my head like twitch out and tweak a little bit. That it's, that's such a simple concept. It's like, oh, you have, you're 29, you've got time. So you're aggressive. Or you're yeah. 18, you have time. You're old. Oh, it's conservative. When in reality, that like, doesn't address the problem. Like it, yeah. you could be 29 and tons of liquidity. Like why, like we, we would be very different. We could be older and have a ton of debt. And we think that we're going to be able to retire because we have a home we've paid off. It's 800,000, but you may not have sold a home before. So do you know you're going to lose 20, 30% of that across five different myriads? Like, I just think the conversation needs to get deeper which all goes to the kind of the, the question, the point I want to talk about with you is I think the tools of robo, the access to data, all these things are fantastic, but I don't think we are still close to a time where we can just hand over financial advisory to an app. I think you still need to have a, a person who can walk you through the process. And it might take, you know, it might take three years of working with facet and the people to learn what you're doing to get your business and your, your orders in, in, you know, in order, so to speak, like it may take that long to be able to get yourself in a position where you can even understand what you're doing. Really? To totally. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. So, like you, you said something uh, around sort of like, you know, a hundred thousand dollars is not a hundred thousand dollars, you know, or it, it means a different thing to everyone. We look at a metric that we call uh, TFLR total financial life resources. And the idea there is that, um, you know, your cash account is your cash account. That's one piece of the puzzle. Right. Um, you know, debt is actually 
uh, not in the balance sheet sense, but in some ways it's an asset, right? right. It gives you an ability to do something. I, that just to, not to cut you off. That's one thing I think really is not talked about enough. The debt thing. And I understand why, and there's of course bad debt and there's people who are really irresponsible, but yeah. debt is something that you should not, it shouldn't be a naughty word. It's almost like in business sales is a naughty word. It's like without sales, there's no revenue. Without debt, there's no advancement. You can't leverage anything. You're just doing dollar to dollar and it's going to take you a while. Totally. And, and think about um, like a mortgage, right? right. Uh, you know, first of all, there's big tax deduction associated with that, right? So like it actually is beneficial. Even if you had all the cash in the world, you would still have a mortgage because right. you want to get that tax deduction, right? right. Um, and and it's, a, it's a way for you to build an asset over time. Um, and and there's, a, there's a, a sort of like, you know, squishier part to all this, which is that like, you know, if you think about kind of how, how the industry talks about success, right? It's all about saving for retirement. That's like by far right. the number one thing is like, we're going to help you save for retirement. <clears throat> all the ads are, you know, old, old couples walking in on the beach and, you know, and then you get like a whale jumping out of the water. You, you can't tell ball. if it's a, a financial company or a Cialis commercial at this point, like literally no idea. You said it, not me, but I was thinking to say exactly. Right. <laughs> um, our view, which I think is a, is a little heretical is that we, you can live a better life today if you have a, a, a better sense of your financial life, right. like in, in real time. And right. there's, there's like so much more, there, there's increasing science around this, around um, financial wellness is actually very closely linked to physical wellness. Yep. And if you are not in a good spot financially, your physical health will deteriorate. Um, so we focus on, on that as much as anything else. And you know what, like having some debt today is not the worst thing in the world, right? I mean, obviously depending on your situation, sure. right? there are a lot of things that I think sort of have this like societal, like negative of connotation that actually we should be talking about and saying, look, for your specific situation, um, you know, the path that is right for you is going to be different than anywhere. You know, you are unique, your financial life is unique and uh, you know, we, we should kind of be open to any and all options. And that's how we approach it. And, and to your original point, I think we are a long way away from technology being able to do that as a pure play standalone thing. Oh, so, in particular, if you're trying to treat the people who are coming new to investing, like I, I just think there's way too many variables to have an algorithm try to tell me anything. And yeah. I think the point that you were trying to get to which is a, a really important part of this conversation is on the debt side, taking the approach of I'm trying to save for retirement, save for retirement, save for retirement means in short that you are making concessions, a lot of concessions along the way so that your quality of life may actually be so like, we don't know how long we're going to live. Like we were recording this the day after Bob Saget died at 65. And I feel like I'm going to cry because that's, a, you know, full house is a show I watched growing up. And it's like, yeah. you don't know how long you have to sacrifice your whole life because you, you think I have to take X percentage of my income and put it in a savings account or put it in some other random you know, bond or something that's just not going to pay out so that when I'm 65, I have money. What if you don't get there? Like there's a yeah. balance. And I think that's where this debt piece really comes in. Like, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. And I think, I, I assume I'm making the assumption that you're going to say what I think you're going to say, particularly around the facet conversation is that you can actually use debt as a tool, again, with responsibility. You can use debt as a tool throughout your life so that you don't have to necessarily leverage your whole youth financially, just so that maybe I'll be lucky at 65 to step away. Like you can use mortgages, you can, you can borrow against collateral or collateral against your, your assets. You can, you know, M1 as an example, lets me borrow 35% of my trading accounts at a 2% interest rate. Like I don't, mm -hmm. as long as you manage your income properly, you're not over your skis. You, you generally can like actually live a pretty healthy life and not have to hoard every single penny to hope you get there at 65. And that's all to me, literacy. That's why something like facet matters is that just having a conversation with one of your people could clarify something to me that I, it could be seven to 15% of my annual money that I'm misappropriating. Totally. Yeah. And, and I, I don't want to um, give like a blanket endorsement to debt again, because first of all, I'm not- No, of course. I, this so. is being responsible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's so much nuance and opportunity out there around how you could potentially live a better financial life today. And I think um, having an expert by your side to help you understand it, an affordable expert, right? I think that's the other key, can really move the needle in terms of you know ov overall happiness. I think the other thing, and this is going a little bit beyond facet, but I think we're sort of a data point in this this broader trend is that 
you know, when you just talked about kind of borrowing against your M1 account, yep. like that actually, the, that product set didn't exist 10 years ago. Right. And we're seeing a huge round of innovation just in financial products, um, which I think is awesome. And, you know, you think about like, okay, 10 years ago, what was your option for debt? Well, it's like you could, you could, you know, if you owned a house, you get, you know, take money out against home equity line, which, you know, isn't always the worst thing. Um, or you could basically rack up credit card debt at like 22 or 23%. Right. And that's not a great plan, nope. right? I don't think that's ever a great plan. We're um, not endorsing and, that here. <laughs> yeah, not endorsing that, <laughs> not, exactly. Not, no. two, per, two percent debt all day long. But like, it, it's actually like a really, really exciting time in the broader fintech landscape because the product set that's out there is evolving. And a lot of the incumbents are getting challenged on people who basically have better cost structures. And right. so they're able to offer much better pricing. And I think traditionally, you know, you've had the industry, and I'll use that term broadly, focus solely on gathering AUM. And then, you know, charging whatever revenue they could get, get away with on that. And then sort of the cost structure be damned, you know, whatever, yep. whatever we need to do to support that revenue. And what, what is happening now, and this is very much our approach at Facet was let's start with the cost piece and figure out how do we deliver a service as efficiently as possible so we can offer it at the absolute lowest cost while still building a great business ourselves. And that's happening, I think, across the spectrum. In the next, you know, 10 to 15 years, you're going to see huge disruption in how products are evaluated and distributed and, and talked about. And I think it's the, the end result is just going to be good for the, the, the consumer. I totally agree with you. And I just, I, I know this is a question that's going to come up after this goes live. So I'm just going to address it here with, with regard and we'll yeah. put a, a nail in the debt coffin here. I, I think one question that people who are somewhat new to investing will look at is like, how is debt going to be good? How does, how does good debt help me get out of my bad debt? How is hmm. taking a, a loan or a borrow against my traded assets good? And I think one of the things that is missed here is like, I'm using myself as an example, but last year I did about 30% returns on the money that I had in M1. So by me putting $10,000 in, I effectively made $3,000 and change back that I could pay off and I could use for other things. The idea of having capital in the markets, having your money work for you, even if you're borrowing a small amount against it and the interest rate's not very high, I can actually start paying off with that money that's making money still here until I pay it back. I can actually pay off the bad debt that has a really shitty interest rate. And mm -hmm. it's just like a matter of moving things over. And I think if you know what you're doing and you're, you're, you're paying attention, then it, it's a, it works. If you don't know, it becomes really dangerous. And I think that's where something like Facet becomes incredibly helpful because it's effectively like having an accountant right there for you to say, listen, this is a scenario. Like, what do I have to do? What, what, how do I protect myself in case my roof caves in and I have to pay for that too? Like, give me options before the shit hits the fan, so to speak. Yeah, I, I think from our viewpoint, you know, we would probably be pretty careful about counseling folks to bank on any sort of market movement right. to borrow against. Yeah. Because yeah. that, can, that can go upside down. Go fast, south, right? south quickly. Yeah. But I think in general, I mean, one of the things that we do, a sort of version of what you're talking about is we call it the debt waterfall. Yep. Where we basically say, okay, let's take a look at all the different loans you have. And let's look at what the interest rate is on, on each of them and then figure out the right order of paying them off to basically save you interest. I mean, it sounds so simple saying it out loud, but it's amazing how that is something that back to kind of basic financial literacy isn't like a natural thought to, to most people. Kind of a fun fact, like in 2021, we helped our clients pay off $340 million of debt. And we think about, you know, average interest rate is probably in the mid. Crazy. That's a lot of money that you can then go and spend doing fun stuff, you know, living life to the fullest and enjoying it or saving it or investing it or whatever. Right. But that's actually, I think, one of the, the metrics that that I'm certainly most proud of when I think about what our client success looks like. And you should be. And, and I would probably argue that one of the reasons that Durable felt pretty comfortable writing you a very fat check is if you take a look at the world around us, you take a look at the people, myself included, who have degrees on the wall that are I'm paying for for eternity, it seems like I am one of millions and millions of people between the ages of 20 years old. And obviously it's even high school kids now. So 15 years old, all the way through about 42 that have been saddled with a ton of debt that they're going to be paying on and having yeah. somebody get in front of them to be like, Hey, here's a way to like set your debt aside and figure out how to pay on it. So you're not completely like destitute. There's a lot of people who are going to be looking for answers. And I yep. think you guys potentially have a lot of answers for those people who, you know, whether they, whether it's because of Twitter and Robinhood and GameStop and the crazy stuff that made people get into investing, I think the next wave of people are getting in because of necessity. 
They literally have to. Yeah, From my vantage point, that puts you guys in just a ridiculously good position. Well, we like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think your investors yeah. think so. I mean, it, it speaks volumes. Um, so I think we've covered this. Like, I, I, I think people who have questions will DM. We can, we can do all this stuff online. Um, yeah. The part I'm, I'm curious about here is, and it's, it's a uniquely different answer. Obviously, people are different, but uniquely different answer almost with every single founder of a fintech company I talked to. Like Brian Barnes, remember one was on here and his, his reason was totally different uh, than I, what I would have expected. You decided to start this. You, you get involved in the, not just finance, but like empowerment movement in finance. Yeah. I'm curious, your upbringing, your background, what, what tipped you off other than the obvious opportunity? Like what was the thing that made you go, not only could I do this and make a great living, but I also could do this and help a ton of people. Yeah, this one is super personal for me, actually. It actually, it starts with my mother who worked for her entire career in financial services. So she worked for Fidelity for a long time and then ultimately T. Rowe Price. And she was on the team that kind of, if you can imagine this back in the day in the, in the 80s, merging uh, 401ks and mutual funds. Yep. And that was like, if you remember like Peter Lynch in his heyday yep. um, with, with the Magellan Fund and like, you know, the kind of star stock pickers in the, in the uh, mutual fund world. Um, and they figured out, hey, we can merge this with retirement accounts and help millions of people save for retirement. Right. And so that was always sort of in the, in the, the, the family zeitgeist yeah. um, when, I was, when I was growing up. And so it was always kind of on my radar. And then my life took a different direction. I ended up in the tech world right out of college. I graduated in 2009 and no, no jobs to be had, right? And so, you know, I was out on the West different Coast. Different financial started. problem. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Not, not, a, not a, a debt problem, just a lack of income problem. Right. But, um, you know, it was out on the West Coast and uh, was joined the early team of a startup that uh, today is called LiveRamp in the advertising technology space. And that uh, eventually sold. And then it's ne- actually now it got spun out. It's a standalone public company, which is pretty cool. And then was sort of like poking around, thinking about what to do next. And, and this was probably 2014, 2015. The Department of Labor uh, tried to put out this rule called the fiduciary rule, which was basically the gist of it was, um, if you're a financial advisor, you're now legally obligated to act in the best interest of your clients. And uh, believe it or not, that actually didn't pass. And so, and, and the industry pushback was, uh, if, if you pass this, you're going to have 8 million advisor, or excuse me, 8 million households that lose their advisor because the advisor can't afford to both service them and act in their best interest at the same time. So, th- so that's like, okay, the industry is very publicly saying, hey, we're screwing 8 million of our clients, but like, yeah. it's better that they're getting screwed, but they have someone to talk to than like yeah. not screwed at all. So, so that was the whole genesis oh of like, God. okay, wait a second. There's like, there's a huge opportunity here. And like, and literally like the industry is saying like, we really don't want to work with these people, um, you know, unless we can charge them an unbelievable amount of money that doesn't make sense for them. And, you know, I, I, uh, a couple other co-founders also, we, we call the tale of three mothers, right? So my one co-founder is a financial planner was working at a high net worth financial advisory firm. And basically he, he couldn't help his mother because she didn't meet the minimums. And then my other, my third co-founder, his mom was a, a, a mailman and like a bag carrier for the, the postal service. She retired, walked down to Edward Jones and put, uh, you know, said, I have, you know, $300,000 of savings. And they tried to sell her an annuity with a 7% commission. And basically, and he, he fortunately caught it. In I was going to say, I hope he raised a hand on that one. Yeah. So it's very personal for all of us. And what's interesting is that, you know, the company's now 300 people. And I, I would say every single person who's here has some connection to either either an aspiration of how the industry could do better or how financial planning could be better or some wrong to right in terms of how you know they or a loved one has not gotten the best unconflicted advice i'm curious so like i always look at real estate and finance as uh, operating what one generation behind reality when it comes to like mm-hmm. regulation and pushing things through and it's, it's not a knock on it it's, it's a very it's like legal as well like very complicated very high level of cash implication, a lot of governing implication. It's just challenging. So there's a reason that it's behind. So I feel like what your mom worked on is uh, you could call it web one, but it's pre-web. So it's kind of like not really what you are identifying in 2014, 15, 16 is web two. Now on Mm -hmm. the, the, the Twitter sphere, everyone's talking about web three, which will just roll it into crypto. I'm curious how you view the things that are coming down. Like, I think there's cool parts of 
the democratized dream of crypto, fine, cool, the volatility, people like it, great. The reality is, and right now we're talking Bitcoins at like 41,000 or something, I hope. I haven't looked since we started. And you never know anymore. 30 minutes in, it yeah. could be down to 20. But I do think that there's going to be a lot of people, whether Bitcoin's a thing or not, that are going to be left holding some sort of bag of not good things. Mm -hmm. How do you guys, how do you, I guess, two frame, how do you personally, and if you want to bring Facet in, it's up to you, totally up to you. But how yeah. do you view starting to talk to people who may be the first generation of people who were introduced to investing through a non-fiat product? One of my favorite questions to ask people, and, and I will I will preface this by saying I know very little about crypto. I, it it, it, it kind of makes my head explode just trying to wrap my head around everything that's going on there. Yes. And it's also, it's changing so quickly, right? right. Um, but, but, you know, I, in my job, I interact with a lot of people who are very pro crypto and, and a lot of people who are, are, you know, real experts in it. And one of my favorite questions to ask is, okay, map this back to the beginning of the internet. What year are we in? Yeah. And consistently in the last year or so, I've heard we're somewhere between 95 and 97. Yep. So, so there's still, we're still figuring it all out. And, you know, you remember 99, 2000, Amazon was a ridiculous idea that was never going to make money. Yep. And then, you know, okay, then we went down to the J curve and now here we are with Amazon as the, you know, second or third most valuable company, company in the world. And so if I'm sort of pattern matching, I think about it in terms of like, all right, is Bitcoin like really the be all end all? I don't know. It could be, but Probably, you know, if you remember like Alta Vista, the search engine, right, right? that used to be like the search engine. Ask and Jeez. now it's Google. Let's go. Yeah, exactly. Right. And Google, you know, Google didn't exist in 96. I'm sort of waiting to see mode like, okay, there, there's probably a, another couple iterations before we sort of figure out, okay, what are sort of the long term Googles or the Amazons of the crypto? What's the blue the chip Google? actually? Exactly. And, and I'm not convinced that anything we're seeing today is it. I'm also not convinced that anything we're seeing today isn't it. So it could, right. could go either way. And the other thing is you think about like specific to fintech, there's so much that is still analog, right? I mean, think about yes. what it takes to ACH money. It's still a three-day process. It's right. crazy. You know, one of my favorite companies out there uh, in the sort of infrastructure world is coming called Orem. I don't know if you've ever come across them, nope. but they're basically trying to trying to like rip out the, the guts of the ACH system and replace it with, you know, with instant money movement. And so, you know, we might still be 10 or 15 years away before that vision is sort of fully attained where I as an individual or as a small business or as a corporation or whatever can transact and send money instantly without any market hours. Like the idea of the wire system is gone. There's like, there's so much just like catch up the analog stuff that we just had to blow out that I think that there's so much room to run in sort of the, the web two version to use your analogy that there's still tremendous value there to be unlocked. I agree with you. I think, you know, when I think of what you guys are providing, it reminds me a little bit of like bumper rails. Like we're going to be in a, in a situation that, you know, doesn't really matter. Honestly, if you get into crypto, it doesn't matter if you're an expert or not, because we, unless you see the future, we just don't know. Like there's certain parts of this that like, I think every expert in crypto would tell you is not sustainable long term. It, it is requiring that Ethereum has a solve, you know, two to three years down the road from now for a problem we're seeing now for it to be successful. So having a person who's your financial advisor who's not telling you you should invest in this, you shouldn't, is just painting a picture. Like, yeah, what is your risk profile? Are you adverse to being in a situation where you could lose everything? If you are, the recommendation is to avoid. You asked sort of like, you know, does does Facet have a view on this and you know, right now, I would say we're we're in a little bit of wait and see mode. Yeah. Um, that being said, what's the stats? Like 52 million people in the country own some form. Yeah, it's of a crazy number. So can't can't ignore it anymore, right? We view our job is to make sure that, as you said, the the guardrails. Uh, you want to dabble in crypto? Totally fine. We're going to make sure that the rest of your financial life is in order. So if Bitcoin has a 30 percent down day, you're not out on the street. That's like job number one for us. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we do manage money, right? So we we have about a billion dollars under management. This year, we will launch some sort of crypto offering. Um, our our philosophy of of sort of investment management is very plain vanilla, like low cost, passive, uh, globally diversified index funds, right? That focuses more on market participation as cheap as you can get it. But you know, we're at a point where it's going to be hard to not have at least some version of a crypto offering for those who want to get in there. There is a there there for sure. I think how it evolves, anyone's guess. First off, thank you for taking the time to come on the show. It's been awesome to learn about Facet. It's been really cool to hear your story. 
I just as a person who's an onlooker probably will become a customer at some point. I look at this and what I really like for those listening to this show, why these conversations are important. What I really like about what you're doing is a lot of the financial institutions of the past and even some that are currently operating today. And I don't mean some like Chase and Bank of America, they're huge. I mean, like even some of the apps that you think are super progressive still operate in sort of a restrictive sort of uh, no until you show me. No, it's no, always no until yes. And I think that we are moving in a, a society is moving so fast that you, I don't think you can be successful and have that attitude. What I see you guys having is a, we're not saying no, we're just saying like, open my eyes. Like we're going to say it may be this and it may not be this, but like, we're going to learn. So all the people who work at fast and who ultimately will help me and everyone who's listening uh, with their money, it's not that they're advising me to do this or to do that. Their job is to know the road that I don't know. And to maybe be the reason I did or I didn't make an investment, less of like, do that. It's not only that, it's also just asking questions. Right. I mean, I have a fast advisor that I work with, right? And That's uh, amazing, by the way. <laughs> That's actually awesome. It's like I eat I mean, my own dog food. It's the best sales totally, pitch of all time. Totally. Yeah. And, he's, and he has saved me from some mistakes. But I think more importantly, he has made me feel so much more secure and, and, and actually pushed me to do things that I probably would have been too conservative to do myself. And you're yep. talking to a guy who's like started a company, right? Like I'm right. not a conservative person by, would appear, by yeah. any stretch, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but he's basically this whole idea of like live a better life today. He's, he's really helpful with that. But so many of our conversations are centered around him sort of saying, okay, like as I've gotten to know you over time, here's how I think about like what makes you happy and like what, you know, two years from now you wake up and here's your situation like, would you be happy if that was the case? And then he says, okay, you know, based on that, I've sort of designed this plan of action and here's what you're going to do to get there. And, you know, he has some obvious recommendations, some non-obvious recommendations, but it's was really one of them a about- multi-billion dollar exit. Was that one of the recommendations? <laughs> we, we don't, we don't bank on that. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, exactly. And, and, and I'm not borrowing against that. No, that no, I'm just- you know? <laughs> um, certainly if, if we achieve our vision, then I think, you know, we'll be a, a, a significant uh, force to be reckoned with in the markets for, for a long time. But that being said, you know, I think for me, it's just taking some time to be introspective and like asking the questions of myself about what's important. Right. It's amazing what that uncovers. And then the, the sort of path to how to get there oftentimes just kind of reveals itself. But having someone who's holding you accountable and, and you know, asking you over time to kind of do that exploration is, is awesome. Well, I love what you're building. Um, congratulations on the round and the success. I Thank think you. everyone should check out uh, facetwealth.com and learn a little bit about what you guys are doing. Uh, I, I think anyone who does not currently have, a, even if you do have a financial advisor, like I think you need to start exploring what's out there because there's so many new companies popping up that kind of handle to your point, different facets to make the pun real, to enable you to live a better life today, which if you don't have facet t-shirts that say that yet, that's your next, 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 next job. Absolutely. Yeah. We have, we have a few things, a few, few things, a few swag things in the work for this year. So love it. Anders, thanks so much for taking the time. Awesome, Scott. Thank you so much for having me.